this is the right time to stop raising rates. And I think that the, uh, the Fed will do that. Um, I've never seen the probability of a rate hike so baked in on the CF, uh, on the CME Fed watch tool. It's at 99.8%. Uh, the probabilities look very good for cuts starting in, in March 2024. What's up, you guys? It's Ocean here. I'm back here today with precious metals expert and founder and president of Wealth Research Group, Mr. Lior Gantz. Lior, how are you today? I'm good. How are you doing? Great. Great to see you again. Thanks for coming back on the channel. Thank you for having me. We're coming off some really good silver and gold buying opportunities. If you look at the 60 day chart, it actually looks like a trough, and we're coming up the spot prices are raising back up now um what factors do you see most heavily weighing on precious metals prices right now i think this week we're doing this uh on the 22nd and on the 26th um we may get an event uh for gold um uh, it's this this is a big deal in uh let me just uh, take you back to December 15th of 2015, the last Fed meeting of that year, that calendar year. And um, I remember that the Fed raised rates for the first time since cutting them to zero and starting the, uh, the uh, zero interest rate era with the QEs. And that was the day that gold bottomed. It bottomed at, at uh, $1,053 an ounce. And since then, it's gone up to over 2,000. It, it came down all the way to 1,200 in September of 2018. And again, now it's nearing uh, 2,000 for, uh, gosh, I think like the fourth time. So what happened was an event. The Fed raised rates for the first time after many years, and that created a bottom. That day is the bottom. Look at the chart. December 15, 2015 is the bottom. A month later, I realized how different this is uh, to society, to, to many things. And that's why I started uh, WealthResearchGroup.com. The free newsletter started literally to alert people that this was the bottom for, for um, gold. And that was the original purpose of the newsletter. Um, what we may see on July 26th with the last rate hike is another sort of uh, event for gold and silver. If uh, the Fed does indicate in in their uh, you know in, in their insinuations that this was the last rate hike, um, and that they do not for, for, uh, anticipate any more unless something warns them, this uh, would create a lot of benefits for the economy. For one, it would end the freeze in real estate. Secondly, it would bring back uh, growth in debt issuance. There's so much debt that needs to be either recycled or issued if um, the um, issuers of debt knew that the Fed was starting to lower rates. And so um, I can tell you that prepping for this interview, I uh, listened to a conference call from one of my favorite companies in my portfolio, um, by the way, you can access my portfolio at wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash portfolio, my entire portfolio. Um, you can download that and, and take a look at it. One of those companies is a huge leveraged uh, play on uh, cutting rates. And the CEO um, really was adamant that if the Fed, uh, if this is the last rate hike, then the company is positioned for immense growth in, in terms of fixed income and if that's the case if this is the ceo of one of the companies that handles bonds mostly in the world that is critical for gold and for silver of course because if rates are projected into the future to go down and if you are following the fed watch tool uh, by the cme group you know that uh that market participants are betting that in march 2024 will be the first rate cut that is pivotal um, for gold and silver. And let me tell you why. 
In December 15, 2015, the Fed raised rates from 0 to 25 to 0 0.25. So it's just a quarter of a percentage. For the rest of 2016, they didn't even bother with another rate hike until December of 2016, a full year. And even though they didn't raise rates even one time, the price of gold rose by 30% that year. And the price of silver, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, over 40%. Over the anticipation that more rate hikes are coming. And that uh, uh, time, rate hikes were bullish uh, for, for gold and silver because it was priced that the Fed is doing that because inflation is getting hot. Now we're on the flip side. Now we have real positive rates in the economy. In other words, the Fed funds rate is higher than the CPI. Um, and so the Fed can definitely start cutting. And if that is the case, that is bearish for the dollar, and that is extremely bullish for silver, and it is bullish for gold. So July 26 can be an event, an event where you would start seeing a rally in gold and, 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 and silver. And that is really important. So when I look at what, what has weighed on the price of gold and silver, what has weighed on them so far are uh, rate hikes. And what will propel them is the rate cuts or the anticipation of the rate cuts. So I feel like we are in a, a great position, uh, especially for silver. And um, the people should really understand that this could be an event. Uh, and, and watch the Fed, uh, watch the Fed FOMC meeting on Wednesday. Watch the Q and A session. On Thursday, by the way, July 27th, if, if you're, if you're a, a, a subscriber to our free newsletter, we will cover everything that uh, the Fed said uh, during their statement and in the Q&A, which is uh, even more important. Yeah, definitely a lot to look forward to at the next meeting. Um, do you think that there's a reasonable chance that there may be another hike in store for this year? Or do you think that um, they're just going to pause for now until until maybe February? I do think that they will pause. Um, there are several reasons that I think they will pause. Uh, the first one is that, as I said, the Fed funds rate is now higher than CPI. So the, the, for them to raise, it would now be against the market's uh, wishes and anticipation. So the, the investors, real estate fund managers, uh, fund managers that manage uh, uh, funds that I'm invested in, they are all speaking the same language. They're all saying, look, CPI, which obviously CPI doesn't measure real inflation for the average person, but it's the barometer for the banking industry. Uh, it's, it's coming down and it's coming down fast and it's cooling. So we are in a great position for the Fed to, to do a higher for longer, um, for the rest of the year. There's no reason to keep raising in CPI. Now, what, what caused the Fed to continue raising rates is not CPI, because that's been trending down uh, nicely for, uh, for months now. The jobs market, which was too uh, tight, too many uh, job openings and, and few people to occupy them, a two to one ratio has been coming down. And now it looks much better, both in terms of sa salaries spiraling up faster than GDP growth or faster than inflation. Uh, we all want salaries to go up, but we want them to go up in, in accord with inflation um, unless productivity is growing. So and, uh, salaries look better. Jobs look better. There's no reason for the Fed to continue to raise rates after this one. This is, this is, ex this is the right time to stop raising rates. And I think that the, uh, the Fed will do that. Um, I've never seen the probability of a rate hike so baked in on the CF uh, on the CME Fed watch tool, it's at 99.8 percent. So it's it's the most undoubted thing that they will raise rates, and then uh, the probabilities look very good for cuts starting in in March 2024. Thanks, Lior. In in that case, I guess right now would be a really good time to purchase precious metals. 
Um, I I think so. Yeah, I uh, there are several reasons for it, but the main one is that if we are entering a period where uh, fixed income is going to become uh, an important investing vehicle, in other words, bonds, and if the yields will start to come down, that is really good for gold. Remember, gold and silver move not on the price or the relative uh, uh, value of the dollar, but on the relative uh, value of real interest rates. And if they are, if the anticipation is that bond yields are coming down, that's half of the equation, right? Because how do you measure uh, real interest rates, either with the break-evens or the tips, or you can kind of think about this. Real interest rates are CPI minus the yield so of the 10-year treasury. So if the yields are coming down, that's, that means that yield minus CPI is becoming more negative and trending down. That's what you want for higher gold and silver prices because that makes cash less relevant. And as you know, the biggest mania in the world right now are money market accounts. Thank you. An another thing I wanted to ask you about is CBDCs. And we've sure. we've talked a little bit about US CBDCs, but something that is really hot right now is the whole story about a potential BRICS, well, new BRICS currency that could be a CBDC and the possibility of that currency being backed by gold. What are your thoughts on that? Sure. Okay. So first off, um, if you want A to Z on CBDCs, I urge you. Uh, I have I have read all of the IMF papers, the World Economic Forum, and BIS, which is the Bank of International Settlements. I've compiled everything. The, the, this is dozens of hours worth of uh, what they've put out on CBDCs. I've put it in in two reports that are six minute reads each. You can literally know everything that's important about CBDCs in 12 minutes of reading if you download these two reports. And then I will accompany that with telling you the updates on um, on what's going on with CBDCs right now. If you go to wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash CBDC and forward slash CBDC in the number two, I guarantee you will know more than 99% of the, of the population about CBDC. Read those reports. And then... This, uh, what I'm about to tell you, are the fresh updates from the last two weeks. So, um, first of all, with re regards to the BRICS and and this uh, rumor that the um, they will issue currency and stuff like that, BRICS are an association of countries. There is nothing binding between the countries of Brazil, Russia, India, and China and South Africa. This is an association. Think about it like a think tank. Uh, they have no mechanisms uh, to, to issue currency, to legislate, or do any framework. So it's not coming. There's there's nothing there. It's, it can be created. And, and as long as these countries don't have anything binding, there's, there's nothing behind this but uh, rumors. Um, and, and, and creating some sort of a, uh, a rally around. So there are countries that would be willing to participate if the BRICS countries ever issued a currency. Um, we have like 40 countries that have signed up tentatively for, um, for that notion, but th there's, there's nothing concrete at all about this. So put that, uh, on the back burner. It's it's not something that that's tangible and and, and real for the moment. Um, CBDCs though are uh, happening very quickly and much rapidly than than um, than before. A as you know, uh, the CBDCs are uh, central bank uh, issued digital currencies. And what's interesting about this is that there are two types of CBDCs. There are wholesale CBDCs which will uh, help central banks to transact among themselves, governments to transact among themselves, and perhaps central banks to transact with commercial banks. So these would be literally uh, um, uh, currency units that you will never touch, feel, or own as a private citizen, and they will just 
capitalize on the cryptography of blockchain, the simplicity of blockchain, and all the benefits of blockchain uh, technology for the benefits of banks and central banks uh, and, and governments, I'm sorry, behind the scenes. This is the one type of uh, CBDC. The second type, the type that people are fearful of, is called a retail CBDC. And that's when you or I or any citizen of any country will be issued currency that is straight from the central bank. And in that scenario, when you do, when you own that, then um, basically money has become part of the, the, the federal government in the United States or of your government in, in any other country. And your commercial bank is no longer the custodian of your money. It is the government. Now you're in, you're, you're in business with the government. And that opens up the door to, um, well, let's start with China, for example, a country that's already piloting with 130 million people. Well, just think about, about their credit score system. Um, and let's say you ran a red light. Uh, let's take a very simple example. The, the government will already find your license plate and will already deduct from your bank, uh, from your banking account the, uh, the fine. You will have a note in your bank that says, ran a red light at such and such street. That's it. And you can take that and, and extrapolate on what else they can do. Um, we already know uh, a lot of the extent of, of what the Chinese government can, can do to their private citizens. Just think about when you have, when they have control over your bank account. Um, to a degree. So in in some countries, uh, giving that much control over your money to uh, a government is uh, very scary. In other Western countries, it, it obviously will not be uh, like that. That's not uh, the culture or the, the system or the regulations or, or anything. But it is still uh, the creation of reciprocity between the government and uh, yourself. For example, the government can issue you your um, your Medicare, your Medicaid, or Social Security in CBDCs only, and essentially force you to to take them, um, and uh, you can perhaps pay your taxes with it, etc. So these will be trickled into the economy um, for various purposes, and at some point they will become more and more um, in use. They're not the point of a central bank uh, of a retail CBDC is not to replace paper money, but it is to accompany it. So it, with regards to how soon it can roll out, I think the FedNow app is sort of a, a first stage, very early stage pilot. Um, and it, it will still take several years before retail CBDCs are introduced in the West to a large degree. And just so we're on the same page, the central banks understand that there are many drawbacks to this. Um, one of them being uh, cyber threats. Uh, second one is uh, how money can flow between countries. So for example, you know, if you uh, don't regulate this in the right way, most of these CBDCs will flock into Venezuela and other countries where you know the, the citizens are begging for, for dollars. Um, so now that it's, it will become digital, you know, in, in, in like 48 hours, half of Venezuela will, will be training with uh, with dollars. So it's it's how to how this plays into foreign reserves. That's a problem. Um, and that's that's important. That's a sovereign problem. Um, and they need to solve that. They haven't cracked how to do this yet. So that's why I'm telling you that there are so many issues on the way um, that uh, they feel like they need to hurry up because DeFi is becoming um, ever more important. And they don't want to compete with cryptocurrencies, especially with the likes of Bitcoin. Um, but that's what's been going on, and that, that is what is happening behind the scenes. They're trying to marry the uh, Bitcoin and DeFi into their systems so they can create a world that, that they still obviously are in charge of, a, of the country's currency. But using the benefits of cryptography and, and blockchain technology, etc. Um, one of the interesting papers from the BIS that just came out, called, literally called the future of money, talked about how you can tokenize the economy 
and create a lot of value to that. And I do agree with that. Uh, for example, if you own silver or gold today, it's very hard to use that as collateral uh, for leverage and for growth in your personal life. It's not like you you can you can take a mortgage on your house, but on your gold and silver, it's very hard to tokenize them um, and and use it to your benefit. Uh, for example, if you if you if you could tokenize your your gold uh, your gold eagles and take a low interest loan uh, uh, with that as collateral, that could be very uh, um, advantageous and almost create like a like a gold backed loan. Um, and that's some of the benefits that that can come with tokenization. So um, I think that uh, smart contracts and tokenization are going to be uh, a big part of our future. Um, and and uh, at some point, you will see uh, retail CBDCs coming along, but it's 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 not something that's easy to do. Um, and I think that it it takes uh, it will take the governments in the West a few more years until they're ready to create massive scale rollouts. Lior, I'm also wondering about any potential bubbles that may be existent in markets right now. Um, okay especially real estate or stocks, do you see any market bubbles occurring right now? Uh, certainly not in real estate. Um, I can tell you that um, I, I, I am an investor in around 12 funds, okay? Just off the top of my head. Uh, most of them concentrated in, in US real estate from Florida to uh, NYC, to uh, Colorado and Texas and all sorts of real estate, industrial, logistics, residential, um, huge uh, multifamily complexes with three, 400 doors. There's no bubble. Uh, in fact, it's the opposite. There's a freeze. But that freeze is uh, creating higher prices because it's, it's so frozen that any... Uh, property that's decent that comes to the market gets uh, offers above the listing price and the reason is that because the lending uh, the, the capital needed for let for borrowing has, has risen so much developers don't want to develop new new homes and you still have a huge shortage of homes in the United States so it creates uh, a lot of uh, very expensive housing and very expensive uh, uh, rents. And I think that, as I said, if the Fed is going to stop raising rates and let the economy run and get free a little bit, you will see the developers starting to come in. You will see a lot of real estate getting recycled, uh, loaned, uh, loans getting uh, issued, uh, second mortgages, and a lot of distressed real estate will not need to go through uh, bankrupt proceedings because... Um, it, it, the problem is not a bubble. We, we don't have a bubble in real estate, but we have what we have is sellers that don't want to sell because th they rather wait, and buyers that don't want to buy because they think the sellers will get more distressed. So you have a lot of fr uh, freezing. Um, so that's with real estate, and I think that freezing can unwind uh, once lending standards are relaxed. Uh, keep in mind that most lending uh, happens in the regional banking sector, which is the one that's really hurting. And the, the the virtuous cycle here is that it's because money has moved so uh, fast to money market accounts and out of the banking system, which is restricting the banks uh, the banking system's ability to issue uh, loans against their assets because their assets have dwindled. There's about ten trillion dollars in money market accounts. Uh, so if you ask me if there's any bubble, it, the money market accounts are a mania right now. Um, and the reason you can see that something is a bubble is if it doesn't make sense. And so if, if you look at the NASDAQ this year, it's up 44%. So to make 6% with money market accounts, that to me it is the bubble. Uh, because the place to be in 2023, the place to be uh, in hindsight was to, to, to buy uh, the NASDAQ when it was on its October lows when it was down 35% from its highs, which is a severe bear market. Uh, instead, uh, most retail investors moved out of uh, stocks just when they were at their lows and put it into 6% yield money market accounts when the biggest recovery um, happened this year. This year is the biggest, uh, it, it's, it's 
year to date, so year to uh, uh, 22nd of, of July, the Nasdaq is having its best year since inception. So to me, I think money will start to come back from money market accounts and into either uh, stocks or real estate, and that will open the economy. If there's a uh, if there's any uh, uh, bubble in in stocks, I would say it's it's certainly in in uh, very uh, concentrated sectors and not as a whole. There's no um, giant market bubble. And the reason is because the public isn't participating yet. Um, and, and so I think that um, many companies that, that I listen to their earnings calls are talking about difficulties. Nobody's trying to tell you everything's amazing or that there's froth and people are spending like crazy. Um, so it, it, it looks like the opposite. It looks like companies are always, uh, for the past two years, have been preparing for hard times have been making things more efficient. It looks like a good process of uh, companies and, and management doing the right thing and focusing on profits and focusing on the bottom line and not trying to grow through debt. So I, no, I don't see uh, bubbles, not in real estate and not in stocks. Lior, you mentioned the CBDC and CBDC2 special report and your published personal portfolio. What other types of content can people find that you've created? Um, well, first of all, the flagship uh, newsletter uh, it is literally the best way to kind of follow um, what I do. And, and basically what I try and do is I try to speak with uh, CEOs and speak with fund managers and hedge fund managers and then to uh, do my own uh, research and read and, and, and listen to earnings calls of companies from all sectors so I can understand about the economy and put that into three uh, publications per week, Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday. On top of that, if you go to our website to wealthresearchgroup.com, on the top menu, you'll see a button that's called Special Reports, and that's where you can find uh, these PDF um, files that you can download and read about specific topics. One of the recent ones that we published, um, apart from the three that you mentioned, uh, one is, is wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash USA, and that's about the U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East and how the U.S. is pulling back more and more by the day from the Middle East and what that's creating with Iran and with the Saudis and why that's basically ending the petrodollar as we know it. Um, you can also read a companion report to that at wealthresearchgroup.com uh, forward slash Saudi and forward slash petro. And I think that in general... What I'm focused on a lot is about the de-globalization that's happening worldwide and creating a world where you have two uh, or more um, uh, economies and, and countries that lead the future and how other countries are trying to figure out where to go. So we, we've reset our entire global uh, system and we're trying to figure out how the new one is will look. That's why you have so much confusion in so many countries because we don't have a new system yet. Um, and I think it will take uh, a couple more years until we really understand how the world looks like post globalization or post peak globalization. Lior, thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. Stack white as the ocean.